Hey everybody, welcome. Hi Eric, nice seeing you. Um, so oh. I'd like to I'd like to start with uh, with the quote on your on your homepage, moneyinstate.com, which I highly recommend by the way. Um, Give me control of nation's money, and I don't care who makes its laws. Uh, talk about that, and talk about how does that relate to Bitcoin, or how relate how Bitcoin relates to that. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll just jump right into that one. Um, the other quote is, give me control of a nation's money and I care not who makes its laws. And this was, uh, this was said by one of the Rothschilds who are, you know, the famous banking family. And um, basically the idea is that uh, the laws of a country are not nearly as important as uh, control or influence of the, the flow of money or capital. Um, and this was obviously a very telling thing for someone in the banking industry to say, uh, and it certainly is very true. I think in general, um, you know, the, the banks will can do whatever they wish so long as they as long as they maintain control over the realm of money, and uh, the rest of the law doesn't really matter to them because money is so crucial to to everything. So uh, it's a great quote when it comes to Bitcoin because. Um, you know the inverse is kind of true as well. If if no one uh, if no one has control of the money, um, then no one need care about the laws as much either. Um, so this is it's sort of a, a motto that I like to live by. And essentially, um, if you are an individual and now you control your own money through Bitcoin, um, you you become sort of the law unto yourself. And I think this is a very important concept when it comes to how Bitcoin works and how it empowers people. Um, so if we're talking about the current framework we have, we're not in Bitcoin yet. Um, when you're saying that, that this is very telling that someone from banking said it, how how does it it work that both banking and the state profit from 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 this scheme? Um, why why are there there uh, why, why are they they aligned in in maintaining the system that we have right now? Yeah. Uh, well, the system would probably be called the, the fiat money system and the fractional reserve banking system. And these two concepts are um, important to understand individually, but together they give the banking industry and the government uh, massive power. Um, basically, the, the fiat fiat means money that is uh, that has value by decree. Essentially, that's what we use U.S. dollars or euros or yen. That's all fiat money. Um, and fiat is important because if you're the group that gets to create and control money, you can create it out of thin air and spend it. Um, you know, everyone understands why counterfeiting is illegal, and yet we have one institution that is given a license to counterfeit whenever they wish. Uh, and why that's permissible, I'm not sure. But somehow people got tricked into allowing one group to do that. Um, so that's that's fiat, and then the, the fractional reserve system is how banks have operated for a long time. Essentially, when they get deposits, they can loan out a multiple um, of the deposit to other people. So if um, if there's ten thousand dollars in deposit, they can loan that out to someone else, and now um, they they make money on the money that they can loan out. But they also create money. That's where this is where the fractional reserve comes from. They create money by loaning out more than they actually have. Um, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Of course, in like a in a free banking economy, that still could happen. The problem is that uh, it's risky, and the risk is borne by the taxpayer when it's a government-based money system, because if banks lend out uh, and they extend themselves too far, and that risk um, collapses in on itself. All the banks in the U.S., of course, are FDIC insured, which means it's just a fancy word for the taxpayers will come and bail you out if the bank fails. So banks, which are private companies, get this amazing uh, benefit, this amazing privilege, this this license, uh, sort of literally to print money through through both the fiat system and the fractional reserve model that they operate upon. Um, so having said that, you're probably not very much surprised about banking uh, or banks not being particularly friendly to Bitcoin. 
Yeah, I, you know, every industry that that, has, that sees a disruptor coming is not going to be super friendly to that industry. Uh, the publishing industry went through this with the internet. Um, banks, of course, have generally felt completely insulated from competition for hundreds of years. And um, finally, now there is a technology that actually challenges them. I don't think they quite realize it. Uh, I don't think they realize the extent of the danger to them. Um, they don't realize that, that this is actually an existential threat to their their business model. Um, they're, they're paying attention to Bitcoin a little bit, but they don't really, you know, they still kind of laugh at it, I think. Um, and as when, when they realize that it's gotten big enough, there's going to come a moment where they become extremely hostile. So far, they've just, so far, they're not that hostile. It, it's more like they don't want to open accounts for Bitcoin companies. That's mostly a regulatory issue because they feel like there's too much risk if they um, they open Bitcoin accounts for, for companies. So it's not that they're opposed to Bitcoin yet, but I think they will be once it grows to a certain size. And that's going to be a very interesting battle because they have all the money in the world and they have uh, all sorts of friends in government that they can lobby very easily. Yeah, they have all the money and they can print more. Um, but yes, I agree with you that, uh, that um, they have not been uh, on full on attack yet, which I was a little bit surprised on one hand. Uh, but um, yes, the most problems are coming from Bitcoin companies not being able to um, open bank accounts. But uh, as you said, that's mainly a regulatory issue. That's something that we need to thank the state and the regulatory framework for not really the bank. The banks are just scared uh, for a good reason. Um, Bitcoin is still Bitcoin business is still peanuts um, compared to the risk that uh, it exposes uh, them to. Um, one of one, one quote that uh, you can hear a lot, um, especially from people from banking, is uh, blockchain is awesome, but Bitcoin is worthless. Um, can you is there a response to that you have? Yeah. So the the difference, of course, with blockchain and Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the the currency unit, and the blockchain is this distributed ledger technology. Um, I think that a lot of people have a really hard time. Um, admitting that the marketplace could come up with a money that might be better. Uh, the, the fact that government controls our money and creates it and is its manager is so strongly ingrained in our culture um, that it sort of becomes a very uncomfortable proposition to suggest that that's not real money. Um, and, you know, all the money we have has ridiculous symbolic propaganda on it, con continually pointing us toward the government as the, the creator and wise steward of our money. Um, so, you know, mo a lot of normal people have that skepticism toward Bitcoin, but, but institutions do as well. And they, some of them will admit that the blockchain might be an interesting uh, technological achievement, and certainly it's much more than interesting. Um, but they're still not willing to admit that um, going alongside that, we it's not only that we have a, a more advanced ledger system than the banks, it's that we actually have a better currency than the governments. Um, and that's a much more frightening proposition because that changes things on a much more fundamental level. And you know, to to their credit, I mean, they can point to it right now and say, look how volatile that currency is. It can't. It's not a real currency. Any any real currency can't be be so volatile. Um, but they don't understand that that's a temporary affliction. They don't understand that that's due to the size of the Bitcoin market. It's very small. It's very new. And people don't know if it's going to crash completely or take over the world. Um, but every day that passes, it becomes more trustworthy. And as the market grows, it will necessarily become more stable. And there will certainly become a point where it reaches, um, where, where its volatility is reduced to such an extent that it actually does compete for trust with national currencies. That will be very interesting to watch. I agree. The the stability comes with liquidity. And by the way, if someone has been watching USD Euro uh, in the last 48 hours, um, it it was getting to the Bitcoin ballpark. Like we were talking, you know, singles of percent volatility within within a day, back mm -hmm. and forth. It was quite nuts. Uh, and those are currencies of, uh, you know, with with 
multi-trillion dollar money supply and, and massive liquidity. So if you can have that kind of uh, volatility in, you know, in such currencies, I, I think it's very telling um, that we are up for, for a big, big change, big shift. Um, I, uh, yeah, I touched over the, 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 the regulations, the regulatory framework. Uh, you have been a staunch opposer to the bit license. Um, can you tell us what is the current state of, of the bit license after the rounds of the feedback and, and the new update? Um, I would like to quote from, from your article a couple of, th couple of things. Um, and um, and just let us know if that is still valid or, or if, if you still consider it a problem. For example, um, th this is quite staggering. Uh, the, this new regulation makes private e-wallets illegal. Read that sentence again. This new regulation makes private e-wallets illegal. Um, is that still the case? How do you um, how do you see it right now? Yeah. So the bit license is the I don't know if it's the unofficial or the official name, but it's the name for the body of, of legislation that's moving through New York State and how they plan to regulate Bitcoin. Uh, why they feel like they need to regulate it when there's already a federal government that has various money laws, I don't know. I guess they just like having more work to do because they then they get larger budgets and have more jobs to fill. But in general, they want to um, they want to completely eliminate many of the great features of Bitcoin, namely its privacy. Uh, and, and people often who work in government believe that they are doing the right thing and that they are good people and that they deserve to have authority and oversight and um, management and control and essentially sovereignty over individual people's affairs. Uh, and this is, of course, antithetical to what America is supposed to be about. Um, American citizens are supposed to be free individuals, and if they are, if they are not uh, even accused or convicted of a crime, in general they should be left alone. I think that's a reasonable principle. I don't know if that makes me an extremist or not, but um, when it comes to money, for some reason politicians seem to think that it's okay for them to, uh, without accusing someone of a crime, without convicting them of a crime, um, to peer into their activities and to force them to reveal what they're doing to the government. And this is very Orwellian, but uh, while people read 1984 and, and most people seem to have a severe distaste for the, for the world that that paints, we're already living in a world that's moving in that direction, but I guess it moves slowly enough that people don't notice. So yeah, the, the bit license, um, it's gone through a few revisions. There have been a few things that have been improved on the edges, but of course that's how these things are designed. They, they come out with a certain wording that is really extreme. People get upset about it and then they tailor it back just a little bit. Everyone gets happy and complacent and then they push it through and the, the whole thing is a negative from the start. So it absolutely should not even exist, but I'm sure it will and I imagine a lot of Bitcoin companies um, are going to block New York users after it does. Uh, indeed, there is a moral, a moral issue here. If you believe that you do not have the right to spy on people who aren't even accused of a crime, then uh, you are faced with either blocking New York or breaking the New York law. And that's, that's the situation that we face here in America. And it's not just that, uh, because what happens is that if you force uh, these companies and especially low budget startups to collect all these information, you are um, exposing their customers to the risk of of, uh, of hack. It's it's not only that the government can ask for, for, for that information, but that information will be accessible um, to someone it should not yeah. be accessible to just because, you know, startups simply can afford a proper this, security and there's a great to focus on it's a great point um, yeah it's a great point I mean we we see these hacks of like target and these other large retailers where millions of people get their personal identities stolen from them um, and that happens because credit cards work in a way where the the store needs to know all the information about you in order to prevent fraud on the credit card um, and it's a terribly vulnerable system, uh, and it's you know multi, you know many billion dollar problem each year. This identity theft that comes from it, 
And now we have this amazing technology called Bitcoin where you can actually pay for things without revealing your personal information. We have this now. This can save people from this problem. And the government comes in and says, hey, wait a second. We st Even though you don't need to store all that data in a central database where it can be hacked, um, we still want you to do that because we want to see it. So you have this technology that fixes the problem, and the government comes in and through law, through through what they write on paper, recreates the entire problem all over again. And so now companies that comply with these New York regulations have to store all the same kind of data that Target did when it was hacked. And unless the, unless the government can guarantee that it can reduce the number of hackings in the world, which of course it cannot, um, it is putting people in danger. And this is a ridiculous irony because much of the justification for these for these laws is, you know, quote unquote, consumer protection. Well, privacy is consumer protection. If you can do if you can do your shopping without revealing all this personal private information, you ha you are protected by the technology. And so, for the government to come in and undo all that uh, is is horribly immoral, and people should should really not put up with it. Yeah, and I'm not sure if, if this is um, if this is intention on their side or if just if it if it is just complete uh, lack of imagination, and they simply take 50 years old uh, regulations and they try to apply them to to something you know this new and this fundamentally different just because they're lazy. Um, I don't know, but um, I well, it's it's an what, issue. What of, I find, it's an issue of priority. Yeah. What I find fascinating is it's um, an issue of priority. So they... Go ahead, Eric. Okay. Um, the the priority is they say that they care about consumer protection, but what they really care about is is control. They want to be able to control things, and uh, in their opinion, they are good people, and so they deserve to control things. Um, but of course, when the two goals are at odds, when their ability to control conflicts with consumer protection, you can really tell their true colors by the priority that they choose to follow. In this case, they force everyone to put all their data in a central database that is vulnerable to hacking. They do that because their priority is not consumer protection, it is control. And so don't listen to their words and their rhetoric, look at their actions and look at the kind of things that they enforce. Mm, yeah, I agree. Um, what what do you is, is there anything you want to say about the the industry's response to this? Um, the well, when you say the industry, um, a lot of individuals have come out vehemently against these laws, these proposals. Uh, a lot of companies stay silent because mostly because they're afraid of, um, you know, getting harmed by the, the government if they make a statement uh, saying that it's bad. Um, I've been pleased with a few of the business leaders that have been sort of clearly opposed to it. Um, of course, they make sure to be very diplomatic and they use so they use soft language and they they're sure to give the um, the politicians all their do respect and you know so they're very polite and and all that but they have um they have come out and kind of said a lot of this stuff in the in the bit license is is wrong essentially so that's good uh, it hasn't been totally radio silent from from the companies um but in general people are they're nervous to speak out against these things because if if the community is generally quiet in terms of the businesses and you're the one business that comes out and says we vehemently oppose this what you guys are doing is wrong and immoral um, who do you think is going to be the target of of the first investigation for violations of the rule? So it's you know it's a terrible problem, and if you're running a company, it's not only your company. You know you have obligation to your shareholders and owners. So you even if you morally feel like you should say something, you're put in this terrible quandary of you know you don't want to risk people's money who put their trust in you, and so on. On we go down the road to tyranny. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I agree, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, that you are you are bringing this up. Um, one last thing from the article um, that I, I, I found very telling and fascinating was the, this is not quote you from you directly, but you quoted uh, the, the paper, um, and that's saying examinations of licenses will be conducted whenever the superintendent deems necessary. I mean, I, I 
I find it fascinating that 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 is really like a quote from 1984. Yeah, <laughs> I know it's it's like a joke, except that it's real. Yeah. <laughs> mm, okay. Um, let's move on to one more thing before we talk about shapeshift. Um, Ponzi scheme. Um, you had a great response to Gary North, who is someone that uh, we can respect. I'm, I'm pretty sure because of you know his knowledge and his his level of argumentation. Um, but he came up, uh, he came up with uh, with uh, this typical accusation of the Bitcoin being a Ponzi scheme. Uh, we're hearing this a lot, uh, either in person or online. Um, please talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so people understandably are wary of of an asset or an investment that that gains, you know, ten thousand percent in a year. Um, generally that never happens in the normal financial world. Um, and so when it does happen, it usually is due to some scheme or fraud or, or Ponzi, uh, situation going on. So it's understandable for, for a casual observer to look at Bitcoin and see its meteoric rise over the last few years and, and just say, okay, something's wrong here. Financial assets are not supposed to move like that. Um, must be, must be a, scam of some kind. That's understandable. But if you actually look into the technology and how it works, uh, you should, within a couple hours, be able to realize why it's not a Ponzi scheme. And yet there are people who are, quote unquote, professional, professionals in the financial and investment world, like this Gary North guy. And uh, he persists in this claim that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. Um, and you know his main argument is that it's it's volatile, and because it's volatile, it can't be a currency, and because it can't be a currency, the whole thing is is based on false uh, presumptions, and it will all fail. And everyone who who buys Bitcoin is just doing it to sell it to the next fool, um, and so he just has this horribly pessimistic view on it. And I I, I had to respond to him, not because I think he would change his mind, but because uh, hopefully, people that read it will realize why Bitcoin is not a Ponzi scheme. And the reason, simply, is because there's an actual valuable service that it provides. Ponzi schemes are, are tricks where you're promised um, a certain function or service or profitable business, and there's no actual business behind it. There's no value created for anyone. There's, there's no utility. And so it's just a, a mirage. Bitcoin has absolute utility. And to... You just have to use it to figure it out. Like you, you can send money to your friend instantly for free. That that's utility. It doesn't mean it has to be the perfect solution in all cases, but it certainly, for many uses, works really well. Um, so there is real utility. That alone means that it that it is not a, a scam. It it actually does something useful. Now you can argue how useful it is. Maybe it's maybe it's just a little useful, or maybe it's going to change the world. And that would you know depending on where you sit on that spectrum is how you would justify a price of you know, a dollar or a million dollars per coin. Um, but to say it's a scam is just highly highly ignorant. It, it means you do not actually understand what scams are. Or, or perhaps, you know, if I'm being pessimistic, you're just using that word as a, a headline attention grabber to get readers. Yeah, I agree. And there's uh, one more thing that um, I mean, Mises could uh, tell us about this in, in his regression theorem. It's, it's not just about utility. Utility is where it starts. Um, but when it comes to media of exchange, the value then then um, then kicks in and, it's, and it's, it's, it's pick, you know, it's picking up by the exchange itself, by the, the expectations of uh, the exchangeability for goods and services in, in the future. Um, the, the the utility just gives it that you know that that first kick before it becomes uh, the media of exchange and that's that's where we were uh, five years ago and, and we moved from from that we uh, you know now now it's 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 a media of exchange it's an, it's an investment it has um, all other functionalities than um, than the the initial technology and the, the utility. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's let's pick up uh, Shapeshift. You had um, you had a great announcement uh, last week. Um, Shapeshift is your new startup. You already uh, had some other startups uh, before. 
or you run some other startups before. Uh, talk about this latest one. Uh, it sounds uh, revolutionary, um, definitely, uh, and interesting. Um, talk about what what does it do? What's your aim? And what uh, and and the race and your maybe your relationship with with uh, with Roger and uh, and with Barry. Okay. Uh, yeah. So Shapeshift is is now my full time work. I've been it's been my project for the last year. Um, it launched back in early August, late late July of last year. Um, and when it launched, um, I had not made it known that it was that it was my project. Uh, and part of the reason for that was that it is well. I'll I'll start with this. It is a a digital currency exchange. So it's a way to convert between uh, digital assets. So you know, Bitcoin to Litecoin or Darkcoin, any of those. Um, and it it came about because I thought it was too hard. It took too long. There's too much friction to buy uh, digital coins. And the fact that we have this digital currency now means that it should move instantly anywhere with no no delay and no problem. This is the promise and the economic benefit of the whole system. So the fact that it took you know an hour or two to deposit money at a at a normal exchange, make an account, put in a bid order, wait for it to fill, withdraw it, all that you know that will easily take an hour. And there's no reason that it needs to. So Shapeshift lets people uh, convert between coins in you know in seconds often, um, or you know at, at most a minute or two. So it's a, a vast improvement in speed, but it's also a vast improvement in um, security because since there are no user accounts, Shapeshift doesn't hold any user funds ever. So when you send a, a coin in to be converted, it, it's instantly converted into the other coin and sent back to you. Um, so Shapeshift doesn't have you know all this holding of money of, of customers. And so I felt like that was a very cool um, Way to do it, and a, a much more secure model. And we see when these exchanges get hacked and all these customers lose money, uh, that's happened really too many times. And so, any time that we can build in uh, security or safety by design, just by the design of how it works, um, I think that's an improvement. Um, so, yeah, it launched last July, and uh, it's been growing fairly fairly quickly. Um, I felt like it was a good time to announce my involvement last week, and um, we have we have some seed investment from Barry Silbert with the Digital Currency uh, Group and Roger Veer, um, both of whom have done amazing things for the industry, and and I feel honored to to call them among my friends. And so you are providing an exchange for a lot of altcoins. Um, now I'm a skeptic. Um, can you give me something to make me start paying attention to at least some of these altcoins? Yeah. So yeah, when you say you're a skeptic, you mean that you're skeptical of the um, of the value of any of these altcoins. So I um, yes, I had been very vehement. Yeah, uh, I had been vehemently opposed to altcoins for quite a while. Uh, the main reason was that I felt like Bitcoin was such a momentous project and so important and there was so much work to do that anyone who's spending time or resources on these sort of side projects uh, was kind of taking away from the the main Bitcoin project that was so important. Um, I changed my view on that to some degree because I saw that all these side coins that were being built, there was a lot of really important uh, technical experimentation that was going on. And I think most of these altcoins are silly and stupid. Most of them will not exist long term. But they are all sort of uh, permitting this cauldron of innovation where people can test out new ideas and new concepts and, and new create new assets. And some of these assets aren't really, they're more like complementary goods to Bitcoin, not, not competitive goods. So for example, um, you have these currencies that are pegged to dollars like uh, BitUSD and, and new bits and um, Tether. And these are all very cool because they, they maintain the value that a dollar is. So they're far more stable than Bitcoin, and yet they move around with the, with the ease and frictionlessness of, of Bitcoin. Um, and so a lot of people like how Bitcoin works and how it operates, and so they're not gonna, they don't just want a digital version of fiat. So it's, but for those who really care about stability, they can, they can have that. So they're, they're complementary goods, and I think the, the ecosystem is healthier 
to the extent that this experimentation goes on. Um, and as I came to that understanding, I realized that that and I and I saw that these altcoins weren't going away. Like many would go away, but the industry itself remained and, and kept growing. And so I realized that there's no reason that it shouldn't be instant for for one asset to convert into another. Each of these popular digital assets should be completely liquid and immediately liquid into anything else. Um, and so that was sort of the, the impetus for Shapeshift. Um, what is the difference? You mentioned the altcoins, which are backed to, to dollar. What is the difference between them, um, or how are they maybe superior if they are um, compared to just colored coins, which might you know end up doing the same purpose but directly on Bitcoin blockchain? Yeah, um, and, and frankly, I don't really, I don't really care which it is. I mean, hopefully, people build in both ways, and the market will kind of figure out what's more secure and what what works better. Um, each of those three that I mentioned, Tether, BitUSD, and NuBits, they all have a sort of different mechanism for pegging to the dollar. Um, and maybe all three will work, maybe none of them will work, but the point is that people are, are experimenting and trying things. Certainly, a lot of that could be done with colored coins as well. So if if you think that's superior, you know, go go get it built, and we'll stick it up on Shapeshift if it gets popular. Okay. Um, let's start picking up uh, picking up some questions. Um, one second. Um, so, a question from Jesse. Uh, it seems like banks are trying to make for digital currency attempts uh, through cell phones uh, and so on. Now we have uh, Facebook Pay um, offering new transfer of fiat. Um, do you think it's possible for banks to emulate emulate Bitcoin function enough to delay the inevitable crash? Or even compete against Bitcoin. Uh, what do you think about all these all these attempts? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess another example is like Apple Pay and, and what Facebook is doing. Um, it's important to understand that those are not those are marginal improvements to the ability to send dollars to people. Uh, they are not entirely new financial foundations. Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is an entirely new foundation. On which people can build financial assets. Um, so yeah, in the short term, I would expect you know huge brands like Facebook and Apple Pay to have way more users of those payment systems than Bitcoin. Um, but the problem is they're building a nice shiny product on top of a decrepit old financial, you know, uh, ruinous swamp where the the core core technology underlying the PayPal payment system is is the US dollar, the, this fiat currency that really should not have any value and only has value by decree of the king. Um, so if they want to build services that improve on on this sort of terrible old financial system, you know, go for it. Make make that system a little less terrible. Um, but Bitcoin has replaced things from the ground up. And so while it is rougher around the edges, while it doesn't have these billion dollar companies building products on it yet, the foundation of it, uh, the distributed ledger, the blockchain, is far superior as a way of tracking and uh, managing a, a economy's money than than is fiat and banks and fractional reserve. Um, so long term, I have no doubt which one will win. Uh, but in the short term, you know, it, it doesn't really bother me that, that these big companies are making payment payment systems. I think they they're not really competitors so much as the, the new these companies are building kind of the, the best of a, of a dying world, and, and Bitcoin is, is the new. Yeah, I agree. It's um, it's very similar in my opinion with with uh, credit cards. Who, I mean, they're they're doing and they have been doing a great job in providing the you know seamless service in the framework that we have. Um, unfortunately, the framework itself is broken, but. Uh, the thing is, the very design of the credit card, as we know it, with the private key essentially printed on, on the credit card and you have to give it away every time you make a transaction, um, just makes it so obsolete and impossible to uh, maintain in the future that, I mean, now, no matter how much they try, they simply are just delaying the inevitable and the, the inherent costs in the anti-fraud, in the insurance. Uh, and everything which is caused just by the basic uh, fundamental design 
uh, make it uh, most probably impossible for them to compete uh, in the long run with uh, with this uh, with this new concept that cryptocurrencies create. Um, yeah, and let me let me add one more thing. Um, you will never be able to send fifty thousand dollars of your Facebook credits to your friend in in Africa, right? You, it, it is stuck to the old financial rails, and it has to comply with all of these rules of the banking system. Um, so it can only be a marginal improvement on the banking system. It can't offer the groundbreaking revolution that is Bitcoin, where you can you can send $10 million to a stranger over the internet, and the stranger can immediately have it and know that it is money good when he when he receives it. And there's no censorship of the transaction. Uh, it is it is just this pure monetary freedom, and uh, Apple Pay and Facebook credits can never match that. I agree. And the the moment that you would um, you know try to unleash um, or you know, they meaning the regulators uh, would try to unleash the the legacy industry and allow them um, first remove their privileges and at the same time allow them to um uh, to um to remove and to, to scrap all the the regulatory hindrance that they are now facing uh with kyc aml and and and, and so on uh, they would most probably turn on to cryptocurrencies uh eventually anyway because uh, the the idea is so revolutionary that uh that the competition would, would make it inevitable for them to go that direction yep Let's put on air another question from Derek. Um, is it a better strategy to push for existing industries to transition to Bitcoin or to create new players, um, however small, in those industries as proof of concept or competition? Uh, Derek is in robots and automa uh, automation, and he can see a great potential for machines handling their own money, uh, but he's not sure which of those strategies uh, would lead to, to, uh, to that world faster or more cert certainly. Um, I think that's that's one of those sort of how do we promote and grow Bitcoin in the best way, and there there isn't really one good answer. I and mean, this is the beauty of a decentralized system. Uh, different people can try to try out different strategies in different industries. Um, so if you if you are close to a certain industry and you know certain people in that industry, you're going to be the best one to figure out how to bring Bitcoin into that world. Um, and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to sort of figure out this like top-down marketing strategy for how Bitcoin connects with the world because it's going to be different in different regions and with different demographics and different industries. Um, okay, before we get uh, we, we start getting any uh, more questions, um, let's get back to Shapeshift a little bit. Um, um, I was thinking seeing all those uh, exchanges and all those um, I mean, transactions and uh, the altcoins um, happening at, at your platform are there any particular altcoins that um, can you see the trend can you see um, which altcoins you know are being hyped and then just disappear um, can you see long-term stability in some of them based on what's happening on your platform yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so there's certainly some interesting data that we've seen. Um, the volume in terms of dollars for each of these coins moving through Shapeshift tends to follow generally the market cap size and the trading volume of those coins. So, um, you know, a coin like Litecoin is going to have a lot more volume than something that's kind of ranked number 20th on on coin market cap. Um, but it's not a perfect representation, and there are some um, there are some other examples. So like Darkcoin, for example, has a really clear use case, right? It's for people who want even more privacy than what Bitcoin offers by default. And so Darkcoin has a higher, a relatively high portion of transactions on Shapeshift, um, more so than some of the coins that are that are larger than it. Like uh, there are, there's a much higher volume of Bitcoin to Darkcoin than Bitcoin to Ripple, even though Ripple, you know, if you measure by market cap, um, or, or dollar exchange value is is a, a larger market. Um, so I think that that speaks to the fact that there's actually use cases for Darkcoin, whereas Ripple maybe not as much yet. 
Um, another thing we see is that when during periods where the Bitcoin price is falling over time, uh, we see a general outflow of value from the altcoins into Bitcoin. And the reverse is also true. So during periods where the Bitcoin price is rising, people generally uh, are leaving Bitcoin into the altcoins. And that sounds confusing at first, but it, it makes total sense when you realize that altcoins are sort of more speculative plays on the cryptocurrency industry. They are more volatile and more risky than Bitcoin. Um, so when Bitcoin's falling, you would expect altcoins to fall more. And when Bitcoin's rising, you would expect altcoins to rise more. They're, they're just a more volatile asset class. So I think I, I would have understood that sort of theoretically before, but um, we actually see that trend in, in Shapeshift, which is interesting. And uh, so you touched uh, dark on, um, and I think a lot of people here uh, are, are interested in that, but maybe not all of them actually know it. What, what exactly is Darkcoin and how do they uh, achieve uh, that higher level of privacy? I wish I could answer that. Um, I'm really not an expert on any or many of the coins that are on Shapeshift other than Bitcoin. Um, so when, when we add a coin, it's not because I've gone and investigated it and think it's going to be a great performer. We basically just kind of sit back and watch what the market does. And those coins that the market starts to get excited about, we consider adding to the platform. So uh, I would not be the right person to tell you why Darkcoin is more anonymous than Bitcoin. Uh, that, that would need to be someone else. But I'm sure their website would, would go a ways in doing that. Yeah, I agree. Um, so um, another thing, um, we spoke about that off air before. Uh, your your profile says you're in uh, you're based in Panama City. That's uh, actually just partially the case. Um, you're all around the place. Which which places, which jurisdictions do you see? Um, you know, are the right ones to to run the Bitcoin business? Uh, which would you recommend? Um, it, is there is there anything or or which would you say are definitely not the place to to be? Um, or, or run uh, Bitcoin well, one thing that I came to learn is that the, the physical location of, of the business or of the people involved is not as important as where the business's customers are. So um, regulation will generally be applied to you based on where your customers are. So um, an example of this is, is in the like online gambling world. There are a lot of online gambling casino companies that are in the U.S. Their operations are in the U.S. They're based there, but they don't serve the U.S. market. They don't allow U.S. customers, um, and they they don't get they don't get hassled. But if you were in some other country and you allowed U.S. customers, then the U.S. government might get upset about that because then you're allowing the free citizens of the United States to make choices with their own money, and that's not permitted. So it generally matters much more where your customers are than where, where you are or where uh, you're, you're actually incorporated. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, do we have any more, wait, my chat is closed up. Uh, any more questions, uh, questions from the audience? Um, if not, Eric, is there anything else that you, you would want to, to talk about? Um, I don't think so. Um, you know, I, th I think in, in general, one, one thing I've noticed is that people have gotten a little wiser with, uh, with their money when it comes to Bitcoin and the industry is certainly maturing. Like when I got involved, you know, three or four years ago, um, it was very clear that it was an amateur industry and every website that was out there was, was created by just kind of hobbyists in their basements and, and now we are here a few years later and we see uh, these big companies raising tens of millions or, or this company 21 a couple weeks ago that, that raised $100 million as their, or $117 million as their first round. Um, these are really good signs that the industry is professionalizing and that incredible talent and teams and productive capacity are being invested into this. Um, and that is all much more important than watching the price charts because the price charts are more prone to sort of 
emotional speculation and, and temporary technical analysis and, and all these things that aren't fundamental. Uh, the fundamental strength of Bitcoin is getting better and better and better. And as these companies that are raising tens of millions of dollars bring these products to market, uh, I think we can expect quite a bit of really amazing things to come I, I'm, you know, I always say this when I do industry, when I do interviews, but it's always more and more exciting to be involved in this. Yeah. Do you have any favorites amongst those that uh, either have been announced recently or that are going through some change? Is there any, any, anything in the industry, um, you know, startup or maybe some, just some general trend uh, in, in some concept that you are really excited about? Um, Right now and for the last couple of months, I've been really excited about the remittance companies um, okay. like BitPesa and Coins.ph and SendBitcoin.mx uh, and a couple others. Um, these are executions and manifestations of what we all imagined would happen, which is that we all realized that Bitcoin would be awesome for, for remittances and international money flows. But it was sort of just in the idea stage and everyone was just kind of excited that it would happen one day. But now actually in the last you know six months, it's actually happening and these companies are real and they have real remittance corridors that they're focusing on where real people that don't care at all about the ideology of Bitcoin or how it works or anything about the blockchain, they just finally can send money um, more easily. And so th this is an amazing demonstration of the use cases of this technology that had been sort of um, fundamentally understood, but not yet very executed. So that's that's the sector that I'm most excited about this year. I think this 2015 is going to be the year where Bitcoin remittances becomes a, a, a substantial uh, a substantial player. That's what people should be watching, I think, for a while. Yeah, I agree. And there, there's a lot of um, skepticism towards uh, that that I'm hearing yesterday. Actually, I had, um, I had a discussion with uh, one investor about this um, and the argument I keep hearing is, yeah, but both parties of this transaction in the remittances actually um, don't, um, they, they don't see Bitcoin at all. They have no idea they're dealing with Bitcoin, um, which, I mean, you might consider negative, but still um, that transaction uh, provides utility for Bitcoin. It provides uh, the liquidity. Um, it uh, it um, makes sure that there are two parties or at least one party which uh, keeps uh, you know Bitcoin uh, on the stock to you know have it ready for something like that uh, to happen. So um, even this doesn't necessarily give too much exposure to Bitcoin per se. At least it gives it uh, the utility and, and the liquidity, which is which is very important. Um, yeah. Question and by Travis: uh, Do you see um, any Netscape app for Bitcoin um, that is outcoming soon to bring it to the masses? Um, I mean, Net, Netscape alone changed the world completely. Uh, so I, do I see one app or one company that is going to change the world as much as Netscape? Uh, no, not yet. Um, but of course, when Netscape came out, I think a lot of people didn't see it as the revolution it would become either. So sometimes you can only answer that in hindsight. But probably the best sort of user interface and experience that I've seen is what Circle has done with their, their customer um, e-wallet. They just have made it really beautiful and, and sleek. And uh, I think I think that will, right now that's the exception. And as that becomes the norm, uh, Bitcoin will become appealing to normal consumers and not just the, the techies and ideologues who have been its, its cheerleaders so far. No. Um, another question from Moi Detkan. I would love to know who that is because it's a Slovak name. Someone is trolling me here and I have no idea who that is. Um, sorry, it's an internal joke in a way. Uh, do you use multi-sig enabled wallets regularly? What is your experience? And maybe talk, talk in general, what is multi-signature wallets uh, for those who don't know? Yeah, um, so a normal wallet is where essentially the wallet has a private key, and as soon as it signs a transaction, the money can be released. Um, and of course, that means that there's only one key that needs to be compromised in one location. Multi-sig is uh, simple conceptually. It just means that there are several private keys that need to sign a transaction for it to be released. So those keys can be in different places and controlled by different people or different criteria. 
um, and this vastly improves the security of a um, of a Bitcoin wallet. So thankfully, the industry is very quickly moving to where multi-sig is not a luxury or a, a weird interest, but is uh, sort of the standard. And I see people uh, in the community, whenever they hear about wallets that are not using multi-sig, they, they kind of rightly call it out and say, you know, that that is antiquated. That's an antiquated model. Why aren't you using multi-sig? Um, so this is this is just an example of the of the industry, you know, getting smarter and wiser and healthier. Um, so I, re I definitely recommend that everyone in Bitcoin understand what multi-sig is. And there are very easy multi-sig wallets to use. Um, you know, BitGo is, is one of the, the leaders right now. Uh, Green Address is another really good one. So um, yeah, you know, at least try it out. See how it works. See how you set up the different signatures. It's not as complicated as it sounds, and it provides vastly more security. If you're only storing small amounts of Bitcoin, you don't need to worry about that stuff, but you should at least be familiar with it. And anyone storing anything significant absolutely has to has to be very familiar with how that works. Yeah, we'll put those in the show notes. Uh, for those who will be watching later, I, I sent uh, put the link to BitGo, um, at least to the chat. Um, thanks for that question. Um, uh, another question from, from uh, Jesse. Uh, can you speak what is going on with Bitcoin Foundation um, do you have any position on it? Uh, is it is it any relevant to Bitcoin world? Yeah, so the, the Bitcoin Foundation has had an amazing ability at attracting controversy. Uh, some may be deserved and, and some just kind of blown out of proportion by the pitchfork mobs. But um, it in general, I think there is a very healthy distrust of anything that represents centralization in the Bitcoin industry. Uh, and this is healthy even though a lot of the criticisms might be overblown. Um, so the Bitcoin Foundation, you know, just, just by its name and how it, it kind of got started early, sort of as a, a central body that would help guide the industry or, or um, encourage it in certain directions or be an advocate for it. Um, anyone that, that steps into that position and, and tries to sort of be a, a, governing is not the right word, but a, a, a central body of information or uh, influence uh, is going to be is going to be attacked by the by the industry, and that's that's fine. Um, that's good. I think they've done a lot of good work. I mean, they the conferences that they'd put on the San Jose conference and the Amsterdam conference were, were two of the most important events in the industry. They bring uh, thousands of people together to to get projects you know figured out and and all the networking that goes on and. Th that alone is a tremendous um, benefit of the foundation, but they also do a lot of things that people don't see, and they are, you know, they are called on by politicians and regulators and banks to to help explain what Bitcoin is. And as much as you may have a distrust of the Bitcoin Foundation, um, it is it is filled with people who are generally passionate about this project. Um, and obviously, there are disagreements on the best strategies, but um, I think people should realize that the Bitcoin Foundation is certainly not an evil organization. Uh, it, it may have it may have problems, and it is right to be skeptical of anything so central. But um, in general, I think they've been a net positive, and I think they're working really hard to kind of clean up their image. And um, you know, ultimately, it is a membership-driven organization, and they do not have power over Bitcoin. So if you don't like them, you don't really have to in interact with them at all. But to the extent that they can encourage people to to donate and sort of uh, bring power and influence together under one roof, they can they can do some good things. And as long as they don't have like actual control, like capital C control over the Bitcoin project, then I don't see any harm in it. Yeah, I think Jesse uh, Jesse here agrees. Um, okay, another question uh, from uh, Crypto Who: uh, Would you see Bitcoin suited uh, to be used for micro payments further down the road as Bitcoin networks grow more expensive? Um, I would add there's uh, this uh, service called uh, ChangeTip, which goes around uh, um, the Bitcoin network piece, and I'm pretty sure we'll see more. But uh, yeah, I'll let you Eric, to talk about that. Um, yeah, so. I didn't quite hear the question. It's it's about microtransactions. You can, you can see it about the video. Uh, if if Bitcoin uh, will be suited for uh, to use uh, to be used as micropayments uh, uh, as Bitcoin yeah. network yeah. grows more expensive, 
Uh, but there is the assumption that Bitcoin network grows more expensive, which I don't think is necessarily the correct one, but I'll let you go on. Yeah. Um, yeah, Bitcoin is absolutely amazing for for microtransactions and even even transactions that happen over the blockchain, it works pretty well for. But in the future, I think most it's going to be sort of a progressive change, but most transactions that are in the Bitcoin world are not going to happen on the blockchain. Um, it is more efficient to do them internally at various parties um, and to use the blockchain more as like a clearing mechanism between these parties. Um, and then, but when you say that, people get really nervous and they're like, well, then isn't, isn't that just re-centralizing the system? Um, and again, that skepticism of anything central is healthy, but it's important to understand that the whereas the banking system and the fiat system is uh, centralized fundamentally at the most basic level, Bitcoin will always be decentralized fundamentally at the most basic level. It, the, the blockchain will always exist and you will always have the right uh, and the ability to send a transaction over that um, over that blockchain network without people being able to censor it or stop it. Um, to the extent that there is a cost to those transactions, a lot of firms will just internalize uh, transactions within their networks. And this is good. This should not be something to fear. This is just more efficiency coming into the system where efficiency makes sense. And as long as you can always opt out of any company, as long as you don't have to use um, any central company, and you can always sort of retreat back into the neutral, decentralized ground of the, the blockchain, uh, I don't think there's any need to worry about that. Um, so yeah, microtransactions can totally be accommodated in that in that model, and um, I think there, you know, Change Tip is a really good example of that. Uh, you know, Coinbase will send a lot of transactions internally, so you can you can tip tiny amounts to people like that, um, and that's that's all great. But you can always go back to the blockchain if you want to. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of Ronald Coase and his thesis why we have companies uh, because, because we have transaction costs and uh, to a certain extent um, centralization um, you know, removes those transaction costs. Um, it, you know, at, at some point um, there, there might be more, more um, disadvantages than, than, than uh, advantages, but um, um, yeah, we'll see the industry establishing itself. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, uh, change tip, uh, but also also Coinbase are doing a lot of off-chain transactions um, without people maybe even realizing it. So um, the, the transaction costs for those are literally zero um, and remain so. Um, by the way, uh, also we actually had transaction fees being slashed tenfold already um, a few months ago, and uh, we can expect that to continue though in a more let's say supply and demand uh, way uh, as integrated in, in the protocol in, in one of its uh, latest uh, latest versions so I wouldn't be uh, too worried um, okay last question uh, what does Eric think of Winklevoss uh, twins and let me pull out the quote from your article on the bit license um, Bitcoin visionaries Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss responded to the announcement with the following. We are pleased that Superintendent Lowski and the Department of Financial Services have embraced Bitcoin and digital uh, assets and created a regulatory framework that protects consumers. And then your comment. Cameron and Tyler, this is shameful. shameful. Lowski has embraced Bitcoin? Really? Dozens of diktats which manage state surveillance and censorship is the very antithesis of Bitcoin. Uh, can you add anything to that? Yeah, um, I won't. I won't comment on the week of I personally, but I'll comment on that sentiment that they express, which is not unique to them. A lot of uh, a lot of people in the industry and even a lot of business leaders feel like they have to use that kind of language, where you sort of bow down to the king and um, and give him all the respect and honor that he feels he deserves. Uh, and why respect and honor is given to people who try to harm other people, peaceful individuals who haven't hurt anyone, I don't know. Uh, I think it's kind of a, a social sickness, but um, that's how a lot of people act. Um, I, I hope that as this industry grows, that people will, at least at the margins, resist uh, this kind of um, coddling of politicians and the, the respect given to people who don't deserve it. 
Um, I understand the point of being diplomatic, and I don't think it's wise for Bitcoiners to make enemies with regulators. Um, but at the same time, the concept of, of you know, respect is an important one and, and honor. And I think that's something that is needed in the in the business world and in, in Bitcoin, certainly. So, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a tricky balance. In general, I'm glad that there are people in Bitcoin working in all different strategies, you know, from the very, the very political who work completely within the system and who, who, you know, lavish praise upon the various regulations, all the way down to like the, the, the most anarchistic anarchists who, who are completely hostile and everything in between. I think it, it's the Hydra strategy that, that wins the day. And um, so ultimately, I, I'm glad that people kind of work in all those directions. Okay, we'll end on that. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Everyone, check out uh, shapeshift.io um, if you want to get uh, your hands on some first altcoins. Uh, it's probably the best place uh, right now to to get them uh, through Bitcoin or through maybe some other altcoins that you already hold. Um, thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Bye.